From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's coming up during our first half hour. A conversation with K-State's Ramalola Lato and a visiting wheat physiologist from Australia, James Hunt. They'll discuss a number of topics in wheat production and management with similarities in both Kansas and Australia. Among those, rotational crops in wheat production systems, intensive nutrient management, managing fallow periods in rotation, and contending with herbicide-resistant weeds in wheat fields. Romulo and James will share some insightful information on all that coming right up. Later on, K-State's Charlie Lee reports on a new study of human antidepressant drug residues showing up in the environment and the potential impact on bird populations. All this and more next on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. You're listening to Agriculture Today. With some frequency, the agronomy department here at Kansas State University is fortunate to have peer researchers from around the world come in to visit the department, see what it's up to, and to exchange notes on those areas of study that the scientists here and scientists there have been looking at. One such occasion occurred just these past few days as a leading wheat researcher from Australia checked into the agronomy department and shared some time visiting with Romulo Lolato, wheat production specialist with K-State Research. Search and extension, and he is accompanied by James Hunt, who is from La Trobe University in Australia. Before we go any further, Romulo, tell us about what brought James to K State. So, Eric, last year, uh, that's when James and I first visited, uh, and we realized that there was several things in common that we were working on. Most of those projects apply to wheat agronomy and wheat genetics, and how genetics interact with agronomy there as well. And James is doing some very interesting work in Australia. And we said, well, perhaps we should establish some more communication here and see what we can extrapolate for Kansas or what we can do here as well. And so we wrote a small grant together and that funded James' visit to Kansas. And next year, I'll go visit Australia as well. So that's how the relationship started at the American Society of Agronomy meetings, uh, November of 2017. Excellent. James, welcome to K-State and to Kansas. Thanks very much, Eric. A bit on your background as a researcher and some of the similarities that your work demonstrates in comparison to what we see in wheat production conditions here in Kansas. Okay, so yeah, I'm an agronomist and I, I work for a, for a university, but in the past I've done a role that's similar to, to Romulo's that I worked for an organization called CSIRO where you had an extension component. I also worked for a what's called a cropping group, so we don't seem to have them in Kansas so much, but they're essentially a um, grower-based research co-op, so growers get together and decide they want research done, and they they fund people to do it. Um, So that's sort of where I started, and I guess I grew up in a wheat-growing, producing region of of Australia, and yeah, went to to university and and trained for, yeah, becoming an agronomist, an ag scientist, I suppose. So the things I, I guess, see in common with Kansas, obviously it's one of the biggest wheat growing regions in the world and, and K-State has one of the biggest agronomy departments in the world. And to put that in, in context, my university has a agronomist and that's me <laughs> and this university's got a whole department. But, yeah, we've got a lot in common in terms of we're growing in semi-arid or low rainfall parts of the world. We've got, got a lot of heat. We've got some freeze damage as well. So, yeah, many of our issues are the same. And so you're tackling those in similar fashions anyway. And and as you're here at K-State and traveling through Kansas, what are some of the things that you've seen so far? Okay, so Romulo has driven me out to to western Kansas and to the sorghum wheat rotations out there. And in some ways they're, they're more similar to what we have in Australia. But the big difference is that we don't have the cold, hard winter that, that Kansas has. So typically we sow our spring wheats in fall, 
autumn, as we call it, and they, they grow over winter and, and flower in spring. But obviously you can't do that here because you've got such a, such a hard winter. So it's looking at those, those differences there. And funnily enough, in Australia, and one of the reasons I was, I was keen to come here, we're looking at growing winter wheats instead of our, our spring wheats for, for various regions. But talking with Romulo, people here are thinking about going the other way and growing <laughs> spring wheats instead of, instead of winter wheats for various regions. So there, There's some talk of that, Romulo, right? There's some talk. I believe uh, there is now a grain craft putting together a program in which they would buy spring wheat, perhaps for a premium, for higher protein content that we typically see in some of the parts of the U.S., especially comparing spring wheats coming from south or north, north Dakota uh, with higher protein content. So that's a new program. There's not many farmers that who are doing that now. But we had a few thousand acres last year, and I think we're going to have another few thousand acres this year as well. So that's one of the ideas that we've been talking about. So, well, in Australia, they're making both work. The few trials that I did with spring wheat, they were about half of the yield of the winter wheat. But perhaps there's something we can do with planting date and kind of help reduce that yield drag. So you're exchanging notes on that. Definitely, yeah. It's exchanging ideas. And um, we were talking about how to go about testing these different cultivars and planting dates and, and when. Uh, I think one of the topics that James has been looking at quite a bit is st- stabilizing flowering date. Uh, I don't know if we have such a problem here in Kansas, but perhaps James can can expand a little bit on how that works for wheat systems in Australia. What's the importance of that? Yeah, sure. So like Kansas, we come out of winter where we've got frost damage, freeze damage, and then we go into summer pretty quick and our summers get hot like Kansas. So you've really only got this little narrow period where wheat can flower if you want yield to be maximised or else you get frozen or you get drought and and heat damage so the issue with our spring wheats and i think you'll probably find once you start growing them here as well is that you've only got this really narrow window to sow them in if you want them to flower on time so that's going to be a a challenge for for kansas growers is working out when they should be sowing can they even sow them early enough or do they have to switch to a faster maybe the wheats from dakota develop too slow to be able to grow in kansas you might need a, a different development type so that's what we are looking for in winter wheats because their um, their flowering date is so stable, which you, you see here. You can sow them over a really broad range of dates and they, they flower at the right time. So, um, yeah, we want to try and make use of that because our cropping programs are getting bigger. It's taking us longer to, to sow our, our wheat programs and we can't get all our spring wheat planted on time, so we're losing yield to, to drought. So we want to open up our sowing window with with winter wheats. But yeah, we've never really grown them before, so we've been doing a lot of experiments comparing winter and, and spring wheats, which is sort of what Romulo is thinking of doing now, and from a quality perspective. And yeah, we've got a real opportunity to collaborate because the reason that people want to grow spring wheats is because of the higher protein. And Romulo sort of said that to me, and I'm like, "What? They, do they have higher protein?" And my initial result was, "Well, is it just because they're yielding less?" And so yeah, we're both going to get data in Australia and Kansas where we can see if there's anything to that or if you get them to flower at the same time they're they're equivalent so yeah there's some very useful things that we can do for growers in in both kansas and australia i think by working together you mentioned james on uh, your trip to western kansas looking at wheat grain sorghum rotations what sorts of rotations are commonplace in australia so i'm from the south and we have winter dominant rainfall where most of the wheat is grown in australia which is western australia and southeastern australia the rain falls in the the winter, so that's quite different to Kansas. So we grow our wheat in rotation with other winter crops, so we don't grow any summer crops. So we grow wheat in rotation with barley, canola, and pulses like legumes and chickpeas and, and field peas, and we only grow one crop a year. But if you go to the north of Australia, to Queensland and northern New South Wales, that's where rainfall becomes summer dominant, like Kansas, and people start to grow wheat in rotation with sorghum. So sorghum's, yeah, one of the wheat and sorghum rotations, pretty common, but they also have chickpeas as another winter crop and, and mung beans as a as a summer crop. But, yeah, wheat and sorghum are the, the big ones. And Romulo, as you talk with James, do you see potential candidates there for Kansas rotations that we're not capitalizing on fully at the moment? Yeah, so that's another discussion that we have had quite a bit as well. Uh, if we look at the different regions in Kansas, we have different dominant rotations, right? So, for example, the south-central part of the state historically has been continuous wheat. There's some room to improvement with canola there in the rotation. It's increasing on corn and soybeans as well. 
look at north central Kansas, a very intensive soybean and wheat rotation. In many times where this wheat is getting planted late, and perhaps we have a, a new drag there. Uh, and as we go to western Kansas, more of the cereals-based rotation, so wheat sorghum fallow or, or wheat long fallow, which is decreasing. In the more recent years, corn getting into the rotation as well. So I think some of the things will be different. For example, in Australia, they don't wouldn't have much corn or soybeans. But I know that in the northwest part of the state, we have been experimenting with, with other legumes as well. Uh, Lucas Hag has been doing some work with field peas there, which might be interesting. But perhaps, James, you could tell us what, what are the benefits? You guys call it break crops, right? Yeah. Uh, so in, the, in this rotation, breaking this continuous rich rotation, what benefits have you seen in Australia? So, yeah, that's been one of the big gains in wheat yield over the, the past 30 years has come from yeah, instead of just growing continuous wheat or continuous cereals, so wheat and barley, that we've had these broadleaf break crops developed. And we didn't really know it, but we were losing a lot of yield to root diseases of various sorts, so crown rot and rhizoctonia and, and take all. And these break crops, as they sound like, they, they give those diseases a break. So you, you get decline in the levels of disease inoculum, and in the case of canola, you get active suppression of of root pathogens. So we see very large yield increases in wheat grown after these break crops compared to wheat grown after wheat or wheat grown after after barley. So on average, we see a yield increase of about 0.8 of a tonne per hectare. Oh, what's that in bushels, Romulo? Help me here. <laughs> That's going to be close to eight bushels per acre. Okay, yep. cool. So after, um, yeah, on canola and a little bit more after after grain legumes, and these being in an environment, so we're talking about 800 kilograms per hectare or, or eight bushels per acre in an environment where the average is two tons per hectare. So a 30, yeah. in a 30 bushel per acre, you're the environment 35. Yeah, so we're getting really big percentage increases from, from growing after after break crops. And yeah, there's been a, it's also been helped by the fact that the prices of those, particularly the, the grain legumes, the pulses, the prices have been, were pretty strong for a long time. So, yeah, growers grew them in, in preference to wheat, but the wheat rotation benefited as well. Well, we need to step aside for a few moments, gentlemen. We're in the midst of a conversation with K-State's Romulo Lolato and a visiting wheat physiologist from Australia, James Hunt. We'll hear more from them in a few moments here on Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. We're back now on Agriculture Today and Mike's side with us here once more. Two wheat production researchers, one from here at K-State, with whom you're quite familiar, Romulo Lolato, and his guest here on the campus this week, a wheat physiologist from La Trobe University in Australia, James Hunt. As we're kicking around several thoughts on wheat production and management right here, I want to ask you, James, about a management concept that is, well, near and dear to Romulo, and he's been taking a look at this in his research here in Kansas, and that is well, more intensive nutrient management and uh, looking at uh, hiking uh, nutrient rates to promote even higher yields. Are you exploring that at all? We are. We're starting to. So a recent analysis of our, our yield gap, so the difference between what farmers are achieving and what they could be achieving based on how much rainfall they're getting, identified that probably the biggest cause, sing, biggest single cause of the yield gap was nitrogen deficiency. And nitrogen management is something we really struggle with in Australia because we're semi-arid and we've got a low input system. We've got to keep our costs low. And our climate's really, really variable. So nitrogen management is all about knowing how much yield you're going to get. If you know how much yield you're going to get, then it's easy. You just We worked out we've got the same rule of thumb. It's 2.6 pounds per acre of nitrogen per bushel of target yield, whereas in Australia it's 40 kilos per hectare of nitrogen per tonne of yield, but that's the same number, just different units. But, yeah, the trick for us is knowing how much our wheat is going to yield because our rainfall is so variable. In any given season, we can go from, well, by the time we're top-dressing nitrogen, we might have 
three months of the growing season to run and depending on how much rain falls in those three months we could go from uh, one ton per hectare up to seven tons per hectare like that's how variable our climate is so getting that nitrogen management right is really tricky and so that's what we're going to start to look at is if we can be doing a better job of that so the only hurdle is knowing solidly what your yield will be yep if you could you need predict do. the future it wouldn't be hard so <laughs> get the crystal ball out so we also talked quite a bit james about fallow management right uh, and the importance of that starter soil water and for us out in western kansas that that is also very important we have relatively low precipitation storage efficiency during the fallow but in many years, that can account for a large proportion of our yield gain here. So this year, for example, Western Kansas has quite a bit of uh, moisture in the subsoil. And to some extent, that gives producer, well, some peace of mind as far as the, the crop at least having water to extract and to yield. Mm. What have you found in Australia as far as fallow management and, and no till? Yeah, that's been a huge recent, well, over the last 20 or so years, way in which yields have increased. In southern Australia, we never thought that summer fallow rain was important because we also have a lot of sheep in our system. And so if it rained in summer, you'd get a bit of green pick and the sheep would, would eat it. But we realised that that was costing our our crops a lot. And that actually, if you look at the numbers, about a third of our wheat yield comes from rain that falls during the summer fallow. So sure, the rain that falls when the crop's growing is important, but a third of our yield comes from from before then so yeah conserving that is is extremely important and that's yeah that's sort of a, a change that's happened over the last decade or two and it's vitally important to us in very dry growing seasons so this year for instance a lot of places have got around only four inches of, of growing season rainfall but they might have had an inch or two of stored soil water and they've been able to grow a, a profitable crop basically because they controlled their summer fallow weeds and and stored that water for use in the in the growing season. But the commitment has been to no-till in Australia. Yeah, heavily. very widespread adoption. Not necessarily because it yields more in and of itself, but it stops wind erosion, so it stops your land blowing away, and it lets you sow a lot earlier than in conventional tillage, and obviously it's cheaper as well. And it's, yeah, it's that no-till allowing much earlier sowing has really been what's driven the big yield gains made under under no-till. There's very little conventional cultivation left. So with less conventional agriculture, you're, are you seeing also uh, problems with uh, resistant weeds? Yes. <laughs> yeah, a lot. <laughs> so we've got a lot of resistance to our in-crop selective herbicides, both in, in grasses and, and broadleaves. And for growers that don't still have sheep in their system, that's a, a huge issue. So um, yeah, we're spending a lot of research. So the I guess the equivalent of our wheat commission is called the Grains Research and Development Corporation, and they're they're national, so they raise a a levy on on all grains sold. They've been spending a lot of money on ways of of combating development of resistance, and and a lot of it is to do with integrated weed management, so using things other than herbicides to control weeds. But, of course, no one wants to go back to cultivation, so you have to get a bit creative and some of the things that we do um, is make more hay so forage crops where we're we're cutting the the crop for hay and getting all the the weed seeds into a bale and shoving it down a cow's throat somewhere we also steve powell's and his group in western australia have done a lot of research on harvest weed seed control so when we're cutting our crops the combine is uh set up to um, collect the chaff fraction and either put it in a, a cart or um, drop it in a narrow windrow where it can be burnt in the paddock. But you're basically any seed that's going into the combine is being caught in that chaff fraction and either yeah, put in a windrow so it can be burnt, kept, or we've even got mechanical mills that go on the back of the combine that crush up that chaff fraction really finely and destroy the, destroy the weed seeds. And plus we're doing stuff around improving our crop competition, so narrowing up our row spacings. We typically have very wide row spacings, getting them narrower, getting our crop more vigorous and competing with weeds more. So a multifaceted approach to dealing with that weed issue. Yeah, absolutely. So just trying to get the population down low and you keep it low and that way when you use your herbicides you're only exposing that mode of action to a, a small population because it's herbicide resistance is a numbers game, right? So the the more individuals that you expose your herbicide to, the more and faster the resistance you get. So 
Yeah, it's about getting the, the weed numbers down low and, and the seed banks low and keeping them low. Well, James, a generic question, but as you look at the broad spectrum here, what do you consider the next formidable challenge in wheat research? Okay. So I guess in Kansas, I'm surprised at how little there seems to be root disease. So in the wheat sorghum intensive rotation in the regions of Australia that do that, they get an awful lot of, of crown rot. So it's like a, a fusarium that affects the the crown and that can take a significant amount of yield away. So yeah, I wonder I wonder whether there's opportunity to, to look at that and if that's costing yield. But I mean we looked at some some crowns of last year's stubble and there's no evidence of it, so maybe it maybe it doesn't happen. But So the Eric did I mean, along the same lines, last three years that I've been here, right, when it comes mid-May, we start seeing several white heads in, in many Kansas wheat fields. Now, many of them are wheat stem maggots, and we can tell that just by pulling the head, but there are some crown rots as well. Now, perhaps we're not paying as much attention. I don't know, maybe that's something that, that I'll particularly start paying more attention because I did not know that in Australia there was such a big yield drag coming from these. So maybe we're just taking it for granted and saying, well, these few white heads are not really going to bring our yields down significantly. Mm. But maybe we're overlooking that as well. So that's definitely something that as extension wheat specialists, I feel obligated to, <laughs> to now that you've visited here, thank you, <laughs> to start working more closely as well. So, Yeah. And in ter- generally in terms of, of big yield gains, yeah, in in the Australian context, I've almost sort of run out of ideas. Well, like we've we've sort of done the summer fallow thing and the break crop thing and um, earlier sowing, and that sort of pushed up our, our yields a long way. And we've obviously got some room to move on on nitrogen, but after that, I've got to start scratching my head and work out where the the next yield gains are going to come from. So, but along that line, genetically speaking, can more headway be made in drought tolerance in wheat? Um. By conventional breeding or by... Either. Well, breeding and genetic modification don't deliver miracles. So, like, if you look over history, breeding gives you about half a percent gain per year over the long term. We probably can't expect any more than that. And in some places, it's even started to to reduce from that. Um, GM and gene editing, sure, they're, they're things that are going to become available, but they're not a miracle solution. You need to find a, a source of that sort of tolerance and that phenotype, and you need to be able to to screen for it. So, yeah, be wary of molecular biologists promising miracles, <laughs> I guess, is, is what I'd say. Like, I think it's technology we should be using, and maybe there is something in there, but, yeah, I'm healthily sceptical is how I'd, I'd describe it. Well, our time is getting short here, but Ramalo, these kinds of exchanges with fellow scientists from around the world are immensely helpful in our plant science programs here at K-State, more directly here, the Wheat Development and Management Program here at the university. Yeah, it's definitely extremely important, and I think for developing ideas, testing new things that perhaps are working on other regions that have somewhat similar problems, so maybe we can also help lift our yield potential here in Kansas doing testing some of these new things, and also just to establish these collaborative projects as well. So now we have a bunch of uh, plenty of ideas that we can actually uh, perhaps work in different continents and, and see if we find a similar solution. It's been good to have you here at K-State on the campus and, moreover, visiting the Kansas wheat industry itself. James, thanks. Thank you very much, Eric and Romulo. Thank you. And Romulo, as always, thanks Thank to you. you. Yep. Joining Romulo Lolato, wheat production specialist, K-State Research and Extension, a visiting agronomist and crop physiologist who specializes in wheat research out of La Trobe University in Australia, James Hunt. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and we'll be back in a few moments after this over the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. And next up, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy and part of DTN. Well, we're drawing ever closer to the final crop progress and condition reports for the year out of the USDA. But the entry for this week, uh, for the week ending on last Sunday, our topsoil moisture supplies in Kansas, 19 percent surplus and 78 percent adequate, only 3 percent short to very short subsoil moisture supplies at 11 percent surplus, 83 percent adequate and 6 percent short to very short. The condition of the Kansas winter wheat crop is is at 43% good to excellent this week, 40% fair, 17% poor to very poor. Winter wheat planting now 95% complete. That is near the average for the date. And emergence at 81%, that's slightly behind the 93% average. As for row crop harvesting, corn harvest is now 92% complete. That's behind the 97% average. Soybean cutting at 81%. That's behind the 94% average for the date, and grain sorghum harvest at 71% behind the 89% average. How close to completion is corn and soybean harvesting nationwide? More about that now from the USDA's Gary Crawford. Looking at USDA's latest crop progress report, you can see... Every single harvest progress number, every single winter wheat progress number... We are behind the five-year average. And except for corn, behind last year's pace. This from USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey. Of course, one big reason. Cold and wet weather. So nationally, USDA reporting 90% of the corn crop in the bin now. That's still a couple of percentage points behind the five-year average. The most problems for corn harvesting are... Across the windswept, snowswept western corn belt. In the Dakotas, for example, just 71% of the corn harvested in North Dakota five-year average there, 88%. 82% harvested in South Dakota, five-year average is 93%. In many areas, corn harvest is being delayed in favor of getting soybeans brought in. Soybeans much more fragile, susceptible to damage when you have wetness and cold conditions. Nationally, 91% of the soybeans have been harvested. That is well behind, though, the five-year average for the U.S. of 96%. And last year's 96%. Rippey says there are a number of states that are at least 10% behind the five-year average. Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, Ohio, and Tennessee. So again, those states skew further to the south and east where it's wet, too wet for just about any field work. Rippey says that pattern may be changing here in the next few days, and that may speed up both soybean and corn harvesting. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Additionally, 80% of the sorghum crop nationally was harvested as of Sunday. That's behind the five-year average of 90%. And NASS estimates that 56% of the nation's winter wheat crop was in good to excellent condition this past week, up two percentage points from the previous week and up from 52% the same time last year. And the European Union Trade Commissioner told U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer that including agriculture in any U.S.-EU trade deal is a non-starter. National Cattlemen's Beef Association Senior Vice President of Government Affairs Colin Woodall says that agriculture must be part of those talks or there can't be any free trade agreement. He says the NCBA and other U.S. agricultural groups will be pressuring the trade representative to make sure that any trade deal worked out with the EU involves them removing any non-tariff trade barriers and basing trade on sound science. Woodall says the most successful trade deals have been those that rely on sound science and remove non-tariff tariff trade barriers. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, the weekly feature for you dairy producers from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State, Milk Lines. Awaiting with that, as always, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning some things you might want to consider in terms of marketing in the upcoming year. You know, as we approach the end of the year, it's a good time to look back and maybe learn from some of the things we did in 2018 and look forward to things that we might do differently in 2019. One of the things you might want to take a look at on your dairy farm is how you do your marketing. Also, how you do your purchasing of major feedstuffs as well and whether or not you need to do some marketing in the background on that as well. You know, on our dairy farms, many times we tend to be more like price takers rather than price makers. In other words, we 
watch the milk market fluctuate, and yet we may not take advantage of opportunities to lock in some margin as we go throughout the year. And I know 2018 was very difficult in that regard. So as you look forward to 2019, what are some things that you might do different? One of the things you might want to consider is if you're not using an advisor currently to help you with marketing decisions, you might want to look around and find one. There are many good ones across the state that can really help you understand what's going on in the markets, not only locally but globally, as we live in a global marketplace now. That may help you make better decisions, more informed decisions, on when you might have opportunities to lock in a profit on your milk. I know that probably sounds a little bit strange to be talking about profit in milk, given where our prices are currently. But as we move into 2019, there may be some opportunities to lock in profits or at least protect the downward movement of the market so that we don't have as large of loss. Again, an advisor can help you with that. Keep in mind that if you're working on the milk side, you probably also need to work on the feed side as well. So if you produce your own feed, that's one question that you have to decide as to whether or not you want to do anything as far as hedging or anything like that in the grain market against crops that you've already produced and are going to run through the cows. If you're going to be purchasing feeds, it might make more sense to be involved in some hedging to protect prices or to lock in prices of those grains. We always have the opportunity to lock in the price of grains, but usually that's only good for about six months. So if we want to go beyond that, we may have to look at some of the forward contracting or hedging type opportunities that we might have. And again, an advisor can help you. Now here's the problem. When we look at the milk market and we look at advisors that can actually give you good information on what's going on in the milk market, that might be a bit difficult to find. On the grain side, it's usually not so difficult because we have a lot of grain production in the state, so a lot of folks on the agronomy side are doing the same thing, just on the opposite side of the fence is what you would be if you're a feed user. So it might be a little tougher to find the person to help you with the milk marketing. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our dairy farmers to take a look at how they might do marketing different in 2019. Thanks, Mike. This reminder to listen to the Agriculture Today podcast anytime you choose, visit agtoday.net where you can listen on demand and find links to subscribe via your app of choice. This is the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today concludes now with another visit featuring Charlie Lee, Wildlife Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And Charlie, you bring us word this week on a new study that gets into the area of human pharmaceutical impacts on wildlife and specifically birds. Yes, we've known for a long period of time that chemical contaminants can reduce biological diversity. That's an additional stressor to wildlife that are already under pressure from things that we more normally think of, like habitat loss or degradation or climate change. In recent years, there has been a information provided that showed pharmaceuticals can contaminate the environment, and they've been identified as a potential risk to wildlife, including birds. Uh, that study was done uh, in India. It was um, done because of the large number of vultures suddenly dying off in India. The product there was diclofenac, uh, was a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug that was used in livestock. And vultures then were feeding on livestock that had been dosed with that particular drug and then uh, dying after just a few feedings. Now that particular drug is used in the United States, but not in livestock. It is uh, only for human use currently. So 
that was the first well-known pharmaceutical that had caused problems in birds. Currently, there's been concern about another pharmaceutical that's widely used, and that would be the drug that's the generic for Prozac. Prozac has been used, in, according to some reports, by as much as 10% of the population in the United States. So Prozac then uh, seems to pass through the system fairly quickly, and high levels of it show up in human sewage. There are a lot of bird life that's around uh, human sewage treatment plants. Those plants provide habitat, they provide food, and usually a fairly large component of birds are feeding on insects in and around those sewage treatment facilities. So consequently, they are exposed to the products which show up in the human sewage. When researchers were looking at the chemical contaminants in human sewage, they found that a lot of the worms, earthworms and others, uh, and bugs found around those sewage treatment plants were contaminated with a low concentration of Prozac, even though that would be found at a level of be less than what 10% would be given for therapeutic purposes in humans. But it was still a significant amount, and they decided, well, let's try this to see what kind of impacts that will have on bird behavior. If Prozac is an antidepressant, it alters uh, human behavior. Uh, one of the side effects of it is a decreased sex drive. Sex drive, uh, courtship behavior is very important for bird reproduction. Perhaps those uh, impacts would be diminished with the low amounts of Prozac that's found around sewage treatment facilities. So they selected a species, and you say in this case starlings, and administered Prozac in this test to see what the impact would be? Yes, they captured wild starlings, uh, brought them into a cage facility, large uh, free flight cages, acclimated them to uh, captivity for a period of about a month, then provided food that had been treated with known levels of Prozac and monitored bird courtship behavior. Some of the information that had come out of that particular study was was not surprising because it replicates what's found in humans or or in mammals. Uh, Basically, the sex drive was decreased. The bird's courtship behavior uh, changed. The males did not find the females uh, as attractive, so it didn't call to them as frequently. The male starlings became more aggressive towards females. They did chase them, pecked on them, pulled out feathers, and it seemed that the female starlings didn't seem to be turned off by the male starlings that had consumed small amounts of Prozac. So the female starlings seemed less interested in the male starlings and were often inconsistent in their behavior. The question then became... If courtship behavior was diminished and and changed, would that result in fewer baby starlings being born into the wild and consequently result in a decline in the number of starlings? And one would presume the answer would be yes. Yeah, and that's still uh, subject to more investigation. But with the changes uh, in sex behavior and realizing that courtship is a very important ritual in bird behavior— Correct, that we're going to end up in seeing a decline in the number of starlings in this case. Now, was, does that replicate into many other species? Again, it's very early in the research, and I think this was done with a f- relatively small number of birds. But I think it, it leads to some questions, and we don't know all of the impacts of products that are prescribed for humans, particularly the fate of those products in the environment. Even after it goes through the sewage treatment facility, there are changes that we can expect in the ecosystem that we may not have anticipated. And though some of those changes could be good, there are folks that would say, maybe we could reverse this and use that as a means of regulating populations. Starlings at some times of the year are considered to be a problem, Mm -hmm. but at other times of the year, they're a beneficial bird when they're consuming insects. So I think one of the things that the researchers noted in this is that they're saying it's not necessarily bad to take antidepressants like Prozac, 
but there is certainly a greater need to come up with new technology that helps us clean out sewage. So there won't be an easy answer for that. Technology will be rather involved, you would think, but it's something that needs to draw attention. Uh, Certainly, I think it's one of those issues that probably not very many people know about, and it's one of those issues that can cause significant impacts that's fairly difficult to quantify those impacts. But I, I guess at this point, it's certainly a first step to trying to document some of the effects of human use of antidepressants in courtship behavior in wild birds. Well, this study gave another look at the question of what human pharmaceuticals may bring to bear on the wildlife populations out there should they enter the environment. And, uh, Charlie, we appreciate the look at this right here. Charlie Lee, wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. That caps off this Tuesday edition. And as always, we appreciate you listening in. Please rejoin us right here tomorrow, won't you? Until then... Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.